Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today? Good, good. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here. Again, my name is Megan Lewis. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter there during the talk and throughout and after as well. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. This session is all about keeping your tests lean. And over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about strategies to scale your automation efficiently. So um, just a little bit more background about me. I am a quality engineer at GitHub. And before working at GitHub, I was a consultant at ThoughtWorks for several, year, for several years. And that was a really great opportunity because I got to work on many different projects and different tech stacks and you know, build test suites up from the ground and also work with really awful ones. Um, and I you know, just learned a lot from that experience. So that's kind of where I drew the inspiration from uh, for this talk today. Um, and I'm going to share that story with you about some of the worst test suites that I've ever worked with and strategies that I took to actually turn them around and get them lean. So before I jump right into things, I want to be really clear about defining um, and I think a good thing to, to, to think about here is automating the most important and most frequently used workflows. Second is reliable test. When writing automation, it's important to make your test be as reliable as possible. Of course, this sounds really obvious, but uh, in practice and over time, especially as the number of tests that you have in your suite grow and grow, it becomes really hard to kind of maintain these tests that have the same consistent results every time. And third is fast test. So, as a quality engineer, I really aim to help my team move quickly with confidence. That's something that I really pride myself on, and I'm always looking for opportunities to make my test faster. Because um, at the end of the day, the faster the test, the faster the time of the total build, and the faster that you can release new features and get them to customers. So I'm going to be talking about each of these three ideas over the session. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a story. This is the story about the worst test suite that I ever worked with. And it was a couple years ago, but I still think about it to this day. <laughs> I think about it quite often and kind of learn from the lessons um, that I took from that project. So uh, I was working at a financial services client in San Francisco a couple years ago, um, and there were a thousand plus tests in, this, um, in the automation suite alone, the UI automation suite. Um, and they had really just grown over time. I got the sense that the team just continued to add and add more tests because it seemed that that was required. Every new feature, every new story needed to have automation test. Um, and I should also mention this was a legacy code base and, and had been around for 10 plus years. So there were lots of things that had built up over time, including the time that it took for the build to run, which was 12 hours uh, to run all of our automated regression test. And they took so long, we ran them overnight, because no one had time to sit around and wait for the results, right? So we would come in in the morning, and every day we would go through and look at the failures, because every day there were failures, 100% of the time. Um, and it was really, really disheartening. Uh, don't look at that for too long, it's kind of disorienting. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I think that's kind of just like what my brain saw as I was looking through and processing all these failures and understand, like trying to just understand what was going wrong. So coming into this team uh, and this situation was really challenging for me. Uh, the fun thing about being a consultant is you get to walk into a place and, you know, be really excited about making a change and disrupting the status quo. And, you know, I was, but first, before I wanted to make a bunch of changes, I really sat back and tried to observe and learn and ask a lot of questions to understand how the team had gotten to, to this point where they felt completely desensitized by the results. There were a lot of like frowny faces when I asked them questions about the test. Um, and I was determined to turn those frowns into tears of joy. I wanted everyone to feel like they could be really proud about the automation suite that you know, everyone had contributed to build. So I was really determined to change everyone's attitude and change behaviors around automated testing. So one thing that uh, I decided to do pretty early on was install build monitors. Um, so they would be you know, very visible within the team area. And you know, a typical build monitor, it shows red for 
failing, yellow for in progress, and green for passing. So again, we saw a lot of red and sometimes yellow if we were there like early and were you know uh, around for seeing the test finish when um, they ran after 12 hours. Um, but eventually one day, after many months, I saw this green light when I walked in in the morning, and it was the best feeling. I also remember this day very clearly, um, and I think I had tears of joy. I was so happy. Um, so from this point, we were all really excited and even more determined to kind of keep this green light going and to maintain this point where we had a test suite that we can be proud of. So how exactly did we get a lean test suite? Um, that's what you might be asking, and that's what I'm going to explain a little bit about. But um, was it because we deleted all the tests? Maybe. Um, but uh, not quite. This was actually something that I desperately wanted to do, um, because I think sometimes you can get to a point where your test can grow completely unmanageable, especially after years and years of adding tons of automated tests, I think it you know, might have been good to start from a clean slate. But the team of quality engineers who had really put a lot of you know, blood, sweat, and tears into writing this test just didn't want to see the, all their hard work go down the drain. So we had to come to a compromise. We had to find out what we can do to really turn this situation upside down. So one of the first things that we focused on was uh, how to maintain valuable tests going forward. So we had to figure out what to do with kind of this mess of tests that we already had and, and go through each and every one of them and figure out if they were still valuable or not and what the path looked like going forward to actually write a uh, valuable test. Um, so I think it's, it's true, and this happens on many projects, where just tests can get outdated. Even I think tests that I wrote like a year ago, it's possible that they might not matter today. Things change, and I think your automation should change as your application does and as your features advance. Um, one thing that was really clear on this project was that there were a lot of just clearly outdated tests. There were a lot of kind of redundant cases that were testing the same kind of things over and over, um, which didn't seem to make a lot of sense to me, um, and things that like, were tested wrong or like, had no clear output. Um, so it really didn't even make sense what the test was actually about and what the purpose was. So I, I saw a lot of these situations. And so what we did was get together as a whole team. There was about 15 of us. And we really had some hard discussions in order to understand how can we clean up these existing tests. Um, and we went through each and every one of them. And then we also wanted to figure out how to kind of have a good framework going forward to build the most valuable test. So here's some ideas for valuable tests and things that we did on this project. Um, first was just completely going through and evaluating everything that was existing and asking a few different questions like what is this test doing at a most basic level is it readable are there very clear defined inputs and outputs what value is this test providing i think you should really be able to look at those inputs and outputs and understand kind of what the purpose of the test is and if you didn't have the test would you be kind of leaving yourself open to uh, regressions that might slip in from not having this test case and is this testing the right thing? I think this is something that I, today, am constantly thinking about. Like, are there other scenarios that might be valid to test? And also, does this, this scenario, this test scenario, even need to belong at a UI level? Can it be like an integration test or a unit test? So I'm constantly looking to push things out of the UI, actually. Um, so we went through these questions as a team, and we were able to kind of um, Nix some tests. So we were able to delete some pretty early on. And I think the, the next thing that we really stressed was that it was about quality and not quantity. Um, this team had gotten to a habit of just kind of automating things just because, like, you know, managers said, OK, every story needs to have automation. And I think it's hard when you have kind of 
lofty and, and um, like 100% code coverage kind of goals because just because you have a bunch of tests does never mean that you're testing the right thing. So I think it was really important to stress that um, we should always be automating the most important thing and we should always be doing that first. And everything else could probably wait till later or maybe we don't need to automate it at all. And another thing that was really important to get through to the team was collaborate on testing. Um, I have seen many situations where testers kind of work in silo and you know are off writing all these test cases. But how do you know um, if like your opinions about what should be tested are the only opinions? Maybe like your team has really valuable opinions as well. So I think when planning, it's great to get opinions about those test scenarios from others on your team, from developers, design, maybe like PM. Um, there's lots of people who can kind of help you, um, who can help you uh, identify different scenarios. And I think this also guarantees that you and your team are all on the same page about the tests that are being delivered. And also work with developers or, or pair when you're actually writing tests. This is helpful for a couple different reasons. Number one, it's going to uh, increase the number of people on your team who actually know how to write and run and debug tests. And that can be very, very valuable. Um, and it also ensures that kind of your tests are written similar to um, production code. Um, and there's not kind of like glaring differences in the style um, that is used. And that brings me to my next point about Treating test code like production code. Um, there are a few things that I always try to do, like writing tests in the same language, keeping tests in the same code base, um, and that ensures you know they can constantly be updated with this at the same time the code is updated, and it doesn't give people excuses about reasons not to run UI test. Um, it really kind of uh, brings everything all together. And I guess the last point is about following the same rules and kind of like syntax style. Um, and again, that just goes at kind of keeping your test code kind of similar to your production code. So after we had kind of uh, an agreement about what valuable tests would look like, we then moved on to reliable test. And this was a really big topic, and this kind of is the area that took us the most amount of time, actually, to get to a point where we had reliable tests, where we could be happy with the results we were seeing every single run. And we found it nice, after having so many tests that were all in one directory, to split them up into multiple subsuites based on feature. And this way, we can kind of have manageable chunks of tests to work with, as well as kind of divide up tests so that everyone was like the owner of one suite. So we found that to be really helpful. And I just want to kind of highlight that even one failure does make a difference. Um, on this team, we had like 100 failures. So I mean, that was a lot more obvious. But the whole point of testing is to gain confidence before changing things. And when you have tests that are not giving consistent results every time, you're just completely doing the opposite of that. And it can become so easy for your team to kind of lose trust in the test. And at that point, it's really, really hard to come back from, which is, again, another reason kind of why I wanted to delete everything and start over, because it seemed like so much hope was already lost. Um, but some ideas for rel uh, reliable tests and some things that we did uh, were to actually monitor flakiness. And this is something that I've been doing a lot recently, is to actually kind of automatically record test failures. Um, just like one strategy that I found helpful is to write test failures directly to a Google Sheet and just like gather some basic information about this test, such as what is the, you know, the name of the test, what is the error message, and how many times has this test failed. And over time, you can just kind of continue to add to that. And it allows you to really kind of see all this valuable information in one place. And with that information, you can take it a step further to do things like perhaps automatically quarantining a test or kind of um, moving it out of the main build um, if you want to like, an analyze it further. Um, and yeah, so taking that a step further, I like to actually do that. Like I like to separate out my tests that have the same result every time from those that don't. Um, 
So the way that this works, uh, there are a couple different ways that you can do it. You can add a tag to different tests as something like flaky or quarantine or whatever the name does. It doesn't really matter. You can also move the test completely to a separate directory temporarily. And the important thing here is that you're running the tests that have the same result every time from those that don't. So even if they are inconsistent, you're still getting that information that they're inconsistent, but it's not affecting your main build. You should, at that point, analyze these tests that don't have consistent results and fix, fix the test. And then I think another part of the fix is to then monitor over time and actually to make sure that the test has been fixed and not to kind of move it back to the main build so prematurely. Um, but after you have enough confidence that it is passing successfully and it, you know, it has passed a few times on this separate build, then you can move it back to the main build. And uh, another thing that might come in handy is to actually automatically rerun the failures. Of course, ideally, tests shouldn't fail at all, but it's kind of bound to happen, right? There are always some things that you have to take into consideration, such as um, you know, environmental kind of issues or connectivity problems. So I think sometimes you're going to need to actually rerun your test. Um, and this also has, has some benefits, such as saving you kind of time and effort from having to rerun a full suite of tests. Um, and then something else that I have started doing recently is to actually rely on specific test selectors that I use within my automation. So I'm not just relying on an ID or a class or a name. I actually add um, a specific element in my HTML, like in this example, I'm calling it data QA. And this is really great because you can just communicate you know, with your team so that everyone knows this is actually being used in UI automation and to not change it. Um, and then this really prevents like, CSS changes from happening under your feet and from having failures that way. And then the last point about reliable tests is to just really make sure that your tests are independent. So tests should all be hermetic. Ever since I learned this word a couple years ago, it's one of my favorite words to use. But basically, it just means that all your tests should be super self-contained and um, you know, have their own data set up and data tear down. And the execution of one should never affect the other. And another thing that's kind of uh, tangentially related is about running tests in a dedicated environment. Uh, I've been on so many different projects where we have like one testing environment and there's people doing manual testing at the same time that automation is running and that can sometimes like really mess things up. So it's, it's really important to try to have dedicated kind of automation environments where your, your UI automation runs. All right, so after we're getting to this point where we felt like our tests were running a lot more reliably, we then needed to focus on kind of the third most important part of our lean test suite, um, which is having fast tests. And I do think this is the third most important thing that we needed to focus on, um, because I think at the end of the day, I'd rather have tests that were always passing reliably and are valuable than tests that might be a little bit slow. So this was kind of the last point that we wanted to work on. And I just want to highlight that tests should not feel like a marathon. So in this project, having tests that you know were running for like 12 hours, like we could never see the finish line. They just seemed to go on and go on and go on. So it was important to think about ways to cut down that time. And in a, a typical kind of deployment pipeline, there's going to be multiple steps. This is just kind of a basic example. Uh, but you might you know, run unit and integration tests first, then do some kind of deployment um, to a specific environment, and run your uh, UI automation test against that. And then you know, there might be steps after that. So just thinking about this, there's always multiple steps in a pipeline. And it's really, really unfortunate um, you know, to like, have each of, these each of these steps take a long time because you can end up spending hours waiting just for your build to finish when that's time that you can be you know, doing, spending something else. So the goal here is really to make each step as fast as possible. But um, in terms of UI tests specifically, there are a few strategies that really help. The first being is to parallelize tests. Um, 
And this is one of the things that I always like to do pretty early on, like when I get to a point where I'm building out a test suite and they just start taking too long, which is like, you know, it's subjective. It's subjective. So I think it's up to you, like in your team, how long is too long. But anytime I feel uncomfortable and like I'm just sitting around waiting for my test, I immediately try to paralyze them. Um, and there are also no specific rules about like how many tests to run at a time. But on the project that I was working with, we had already split up all these 1,000 tests into different subsuites. So we already had some kind of separation there. And then within each of the suites, we were able to kick off multiple classes at the same time and run a lot of different tests in parallel. And I mentioned this earlier, but whenever possible, I am really trying to look for ways to avoid testing in the UI. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the testing pyramid, but at the most basic level, I always want to be worrying about having the least number of UI tests and trying to do a lot more automation and testing at lower levels. So um, I think that um, Something that I experienced on a, a project that I was on a couple months ago, we had this goal where we wanted to automate all of these manual release checkpoints. And, you know, really great idea. No one wants to have to go through a bunch of manual testing when it's time to release. But we jumped straight into thinking, okay, let's, you know, automate these tests with Selenium, and um, we're going to save a lot of time manually testing. But what happened was pretty, pretty soon on, after we had just automated several of these workflows, like, our build time had increased a ton, uh, like, it doubled or something. So I think it was clear that maybe that wasn't the best, uh, the best thing to do. So we started instead um, writing integration tests or kind of service level tests where we were uh, still kind of doing the same thing, but it was, you know, taking a couple seconds as opposed to, like, a minute or something. So we really saved a lot of time there. And then the last point is about headless test. So um, headless tests are a really great option for running browser tests without the, the GUI. Um, and you can save a lot of time there. Uh, there. And you don't have to worry about kind of like annoying browser windows popping up and like waiting for the page to render. And it's also great for CI and remote servers because um, especially if these servers don't have any kind of like display output installed or you don't have, you don't have browsers installed there, it can really um, be convenient to run your test headlessly. Um, and then there are a bunch of tools that can help you do this. Um, I'm not going to talk specifically about that, but it kind of just depends on your tech stack um, and kind of what works for you. Um, so that's it. Those are some of the main strategies that I followed both, both on that awful um, automation project that I was on. And at the end of the day, we really were able to um, kind of turn this test suite around completely. So initially, um, it took 12 hours to run overnight. And with all the tests that we ended up removing over time, and by running these tests in parallel, it went from 12 hours down to an hour. So it was like, a huge, huge change. And I could feel that the team was really excited about these changes and had a lot more motivation going forward to write and maintain automation going forward. So just a few things to remember as I close up is that there are always going to be trade-offs. Um, I mentioned this process took us months. Like, you know, it took us months because we were balancing trying to clean up this test suite with also, you know, our day-to-day -day work of like testing new features and, you know, so it was always a balance and we had to, to kind of prioritize what do we want to work on first? Do we want to take, make our tests more valuable or reliable or fast? So I think there's always going to be trade-offs that you have to take and priorities to manage. Uh, I've said this a lot, but I totally think it's okay to start over. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if there's much to add about that, but sometimes you might get to the point where it's just going to take so long to go through and clean up a bunch of old tests. You might just be, you know, um, making things easier on yourself to kind of just start from a clean slate and really work with your team to build up a, a really nice, shiny new test suite. Um, and then the last point is that testing is a team effort. Um, 
Quality should never just be the responsibility of quality engineers. It really is a team effort, and everyone should be concerned about the types and the levels of testing that you're doing on your projects. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you so much. And we have five minutes for questions. Do we have time for questions? Well, we have time for one question. Oh, for Where one is the question. lucky person? And then also, I have a bunch of GitHub stickers if anyone wants some. They're up here, but I'll carry them around I, with I me huh? and <laughs> find somewhere one. to put them after. <laughs> okay, so one question. Sorry. I don't know. How okay, uh, Rolf, maybe. Hi. So, uh, how many tests in parallel do you think it's uh, safe to run? safe to run? It's, you know, I, I don't know. There's not a great answer for that. It really depends on the resources that you have available to you. So if you're using, you know, like, like a cloud testing tool like Sauce Labs, you know, there are different, like, a, a different number of virtual machines that you might have. If you're using the grid, you can, like, you know, have a lot of flexibility in, like, the number of VMs that you're able to set up there. So I, there's never a set rule. It's just about, like, the, the number of resources that you're willing to kind of set up and maintain to do uh, parallel testing. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you. we do not have time for more questions, uh, so please contact Thank Megan you everyone. via Twitter and big applause. Thank you. Thank you.